This is a 2006 Porsche Cayenne Turbo S. And back in the day, it was a huge deal. It had 520 horsepower. It did zero to 60 in the fours. 17 years ago, nothing in the SUV realm was this fast. These days, performance luxury SUVs are everywhere. But today, I'm going to review the one that started it all, and I'll show you all of the quirks and features of the original Cayenne Turbo S. Before I get started, big news, this Cayenne Turbo S is currently for sale and it's being auctioned live on cars and bids. This thing has massive power and it's benefited from massive depreciation and it's offered on cars and bids by an excellent seller. So once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to head over to the live auction for this Cayenne Turbo S where you can bid on it and buy it only on cars and bids. All right, time for the quirks and features of the original Cayenne Turbo S. And I'm going to start with a general overview of this car and what makes it special. So the original Porsche Cayenne came out for the 2003 model year. And back then, the lineup had an enormous range to it. The base model Cayenne used a 3.2 liter V6 that was shared with the Volkswagen Golf. Now, admittedly, it was the R32 Golf, the high-performance version, but still, it was a Cayenne sharing its engine with a Golf platform vehicle. It was crazy. Now, if you bought that original base-level Cayenne, you had 240 horsepower. That was it. A 0-60 to 60 time in the mid-9-second range for the Porsche SUV. Not exactly fast. And a sticker price in the low to mid-$40,000 range. Or you could step up to a wide variety of other Cayenne models with this at the top of the range. The Turbo S had a 4.5 liter twin turbo V8 that made 520 horsepower. This cost $113,000 to start. Its base price was almost three times that of the base model Cayenne. It was massively expensive for the time and massively powerful. It did 0 to 60 in the high four second range, a lot faster than that entry-level Cayenne. Now, back in the early to mid-2000s, when Porsche was coming out with these turbocharged Cayenne models, there was basically nothing else on the market that was like it. Mercedes had tried with the ML55 AMG, and that was a performance luxury SUV, but nowhere near as fast as the Cayenne Turbo and Turbo S. Of course, there had been the GMC Typhoon years earlier, but it wasn't a luxury SUV, just performance. This this combined all that in a way nobody had before. Massive power, massive luxury, and a massive price tag. Even the base Cayenne Turbo was 90 grand, with the Turbo S, like I said, starting around $113,000. And with the original Cayenne, there were quite a few interesting quirks and features. This was Porsche's first ever SUV, so it wasn't a vehicle that was refined over years of figuring out what customers wanted. It was a totally new ground up thing and some of the decisions they made were weird. <laughs> Starting with the key, which is this, it's in the shape of a Porsche Cayenne. You can see the headlights at the front, and then the buttons are like the windows and the roof, and there's even side windows kind of on the side of the key where you'd have windows on your Cayenne. Now, in the years since this car came out, weird keys have become more common, even in the shapes of cars. But 20 years ago, this key was totally bizarre. I remember seeing this as a kid and thinking it was one of the strangest keys in existence, a key shaped like the vehicle itself. So strange. Now, when you got inside the Cayenne, you stuck the key into the left of the steering wheel, which was also unusual for SUV buyers at the time. Porsche had been doing this in their sports cars for years to mimic the old Le Mans start, where you'd stick in the key with one hand, put it in gear with the other hand to get going faster in a race. But in an SUV, it was weird and a little unorthodox, but that was Porsche. Now, also 
Also, when you climbed inside this car, you were faced with a beautiful interior, at least for the day. A lot of luxury cars in the 90s and early 2000s overused plastics, but this was coming out in an era where they were getting past that. So you have a lot of leather, a lot of high quality materials. It's still a very functional interior, not a lot of cool swoopy lines or interesting style, but it was an attractive, beautiful interior with nice materials pretty much everywhere you look. Now, a lot of these early Cayenne models had wood trim all over the interior, such was the custom of the day for luxury vehicles, even performance ones. But this Turbo S is all carbon fiber. You can see these center grab handles are finished in carbon fiber, and same deal with the grab handles over on the door panels. This was uncommon. Carbon fiber at this time was mostly restricted to high performance sports cars. You didn't really see it on an SUV very frequently, but this was the SUV that would have carbon fiber, and so it did. And Speaking of those grab handles in the center console, you will notice that they are positioned near this little bank of switches, which control this Cayenne's unusually impressive off-road capability. The switch over on the right adjusts the air suspension. You can push it up and actually lift the Cayenne up for more ground clearance. This was uncommon on SUVs from this era, but the Cayenne had it. And over on the left, this switch controlled the two-speed transfer case. You had a low range gear in this vehicle for serious off-roading capability. It seems crazy now that Porsche had a two-speed transfer case with low range and height adjustable suspension for off-roading, but back in the day they wanted the Cayenne to be the best at everything. They wanted it to be the best off-roader and the fastest SUV. So 520 horsepower and all of this stuff, you could do that. The drawback was it was heavy. These weighed in around 5,200 pounds, which is still heavy even by modern standards more than 20 years later. What Porsche discovered was their customers didn't really use or care about the off-road stuff. So the next generation Cayenne, which came out in 2011, Porsche ditched it and focused on on-road performance only. As a result, those are faster, more agile on-road, but they don't have the capabilities of the original Cayenne. But anyway, on to some other interesting quirks in here. Heated front seats, you can see the control here. It's a little dial and it has five different levels, as if your butt can tell the difference between heated seat level three and heated seat level four. Usually in most cars it's just on or off. Maybe there's two levels, not here. There are five for the discerning heated seat enthusiast. Now below this in the center control stack at the bottom, you can see your climate controls. They function easily enough. Little switches on the outside adjust the fan speed and the switches on the inside adjust the temperature. But where's all the other climate controls? The answer is you push down this little panel that says Turbo S and reverse feel like the air vent placement control. If you want it on the windshield or at your feet, that's where you control that. When you're done, you flip the panel back in place so you can be reminded that you drive a Turbo S. Now, also in this vicinity, you can see the gear selector, which in this Cayenne is an automatic. In fact, they all were. Porsche did offer manual Cayennes, but only with the base model engine and then later in the GTS. The Turbo was never available with a manual transmission. You could control it manually, though. You'd slide slide over from D into the plus minus area, and then you could shift up or down with the gear selector or with these buttons on the steering wheel. They say Tiptronic with plus or minus. You could upshift or downshift with your thumbs on either side of the wheel. You had plus minus on both sides. This is the days before shift paddles came and you had upshift on the right, downshift on the left. Back then they had no idea what they were doing. So you had little Tiptronic shifter switches, which seems old school today. And speaking of of buttons. This car had a lot of them in the center control stack, as you can see. You got a big screen here, but it wasn't a touch screen. In fact, it was controlled entirely with these buttons and switches and dials all around the screen. You can see when you encounter something like this, why automakers have gone to touch screens, because controlling all this car's features with a group of buttons and switches is just difficult. There's too many menus, too many screens, and it becomes challenging. And you got to take your eyes off the road to do pretty much all of it. Frankly, a touchscreen is just more intuitive. With that said, there was one clever button feature they did to make it easier to use. You can see on the number pad, all of the buttons pop out except the five, which pushes in. The thinking was you could stick your hand down here, feel the five, and then you knew where on the number pad you were. In case you wanted to press nine, well, you knew where that was relative to the five, and so that was a pretty cool idea. Otherwise, it is button overload in here. Now, there's also a a 
screen in the middle of the gauge cluster, which was an unusual step forward for Porsche. Before this car, the tachometer had been in the center, but luxury buyers wanted luxury cutting edge features, and so you had a screen. It was controlled on the windshield wiper stock with three buttons. You had a little switch at the end that went up or down, and then a button at the bottom where you could click on stuff. And that's how you moved around the screen. It was very cumbersome, but it was an early attempt at a gauge cluster screen, which of course has now proliferated to basically every vehicle in the market having a full screen gauge cluster. It started with early ideas like this one. But anyway, on from the screens to some other interesting quirks in here. One is the glove box. You open it by pushing this little panel at the keyhole and it pops open. There's this little dial on the top that would turn on the glove box cooling. If you wanted to stick something in here, keep it cool, like a sandwich you were having for lunch, you could do that in your Cayenne glove box. Another interesting control is the sunroof, which is opened with this dial. You twist it and then the sunroof would open a distance that corresponded to the amount of twist. And you could be very precise, little twists and it would open a little bit more if you had a very specific position where you wanted the sunroof, a little bit of a strange control. And also rather strange is the parking sensors for this car. You had this little panel mounted on the front of the dashboard and as you got close to something, it would light up in increasingly urgent lights, first green, then yellow, then red, to let you know how close you were to hitting something. It was the same deal in back. You had a little panel mounted on the ceiling in back that you could see in your rear view mirror. And as you backed up, again, lights would change colors with increasing urgency to let you know how close you were. This seems like a very odd parking sensor system by modern standards, but Mercedes-Benz had used something similar in their vehicles for years, and I have no doubt that's where Porsche got it. Of course, since then, we've gone to cameras and beepers, and these sort of systems have gone away. But at the time, it was cutting edge. And next we move on to the back seat, which has pretty good room for passengers, especially children, as my friend Charlie here is demonstrating. You could easily use this as a family SUV to cart around your kids, and many people did back in the day. Even though it was so fast and luxurious, it was a pretty good family hauler for people who didn't want to surrender to the boring minivan. But even for adults back here, it's reasonably large. Not huge, but you do have decent knee room, headroom, legroom. You could totally make do in the back. Plus, there were quite a lot of interesting comfort features back here, like heated rear seats with, again, five levels of heating for the most discerning butt. <laughs> I guess. You also had climate control vents back here, so you did get some air specifically for the rear seat passengers, and in the rear center console area, you have this little tab, which opens up for cup holders, a nice luxury touch, and this little tab, which opens up for a cigarette lighter, just in case you want to be smoking in the back of your Cayenne. And of course, with a cigarette lighter comes an ashtray, they stuck it here in the door pocket storage area. It really looks looks like an afterthought, almost as if they weren't gonna put a cigarette lighter and ashtrays back here. But then at the very last second, someone said, no, you gotta have ashtrays in your family SUV back seat. People might be smoking back here, and so they did. You also had a little storage area that came out of the center of the rear seats. You can put this down, open it up, and there's a little storage in there for stuff. But maybe the nicest luxury touch back here was a built-in sunshade for rear passengers. You pull on this tab, and you could lift up the sunshade, clip it into place, and then you could ride back here not affected by the sun. Of course, this was actually especially useful for infants or toddlers who are sensitive to sunlight, but a nice feature to have that built in, not common back in 2006. But anyway, next we move into the cargo area where you have a little hidden trick that not many people know about, including, I suspect, a lot of people who actually own this vehicle. <laughs> okay, so to open up the tailgate, you got a little Little popper above the license plate like in most vehicles and you lift it up and it's heavy but you can open it. Now in this particular Cayenne the struts don't work anymore so it falls right back down which is kind of annoying but you have a secret second way to get into the cargo area. In the center of the rear window the bottom you have the wiper here and there's a hidden button under the wiper assembly. If you push that you can pop open just the tailgate glass open it up and then it stays in place no problem problem, probably because it hasn't worn out since most people don't even know it's there to use it. Now, this is always a cool feature when the tailgate glass can open independently of the tailgate itself, but most
most automakers, including Porsche, have abandoned it. It adds some mechanical complexity back here. Most people don't really use it, although there are some great uses for it, but the original Cayenne did in fact offer this. Now, when you get into the cargo area, you'll notice well, it's not really all that special. Fairly large. You can get a decent amount of stuff back here, but nothing particularly unusual or quirky or weird. You do have two little 12 volt power plugs, so you can charge stuff from the cargo area, which is a nice innovation, especially for 2006. But otherwise, you get a cargo cover, which slides over to cover your stuff, pretty standard. And you have this little net that comes up from the cargo cover assembly that you can clip into place and keep a pet from like, getting from the cargo area to the interior. That's not all that unusual in the cargo area in general, not especially quirky in the Cayenne Turbo S. And next we move on to the exterior of the original Cayenne Turbo S, which was controversial. That's because Porsche made the same mistake that every other luxury performance brand has made and continues to make when creating SUVs, which is they try to make their first SUV look like their sports cars or their cars. Bentley did it, Rolls-Royce did it, Lamborghini and Ferrari have done it especially poorly, but Porsche tried it too when this first came out and reception was not great. The headlights looked like the ones in the 911 and the Boxster. That gave it kind of the sports car tie-in. And in back you had this rear curvy arch instead of just a slab side like a Range Rover had or most other SUVs. And it definitely translated a little odd to an SUV design. And critics were very severe with their harsh opinions at the time. So much so that Porsche did a pretty substantial facelift for the 2008 model year that kind of sharpened things up a bit, lost some of the curvy, flowy lines borrowed from the sports cars, and gave the Cayenne more of its own look, and that was better received. Now, I've never loved the original Cayenne look, but it has grown on me in recent years. It's so emblematic of its era, and frankly, I also like how subtle it was. This was the top-of-the-line Turbo S model, but you could barely tell. The only giveaways were a larger front air dam on the turbo models. The air intakes were larger, obviously, to get more air into the engine. You also had red brake calipers on the turbos, which gave you the air of performance. And you had bigger wheels, although not much bigger. As you can see here, they're not exactly huge, giant things like you have in performance SUVs now. They were still relatively restrained and subtle, just bigger than what you got in the base model. And of course, around back, you had a quad exhaust that helped give it more of a mean look and a mean sound, mostly. Take a listen. But other than that, this was relatively subtle, and only in the years since have performance luxury SUVs really started to exaggerate their performance with cosmetic touches on the outside designed to make you look at them and know they're fast and expensive. By the way, one other interesting thing about the Cayenne Turbo S, even though the Cayenne came out in 03, the Turbo S didn't come out till 06, which was actually the last year of the pre-facelift Cayenne, meaning that this body style of the Turbo S was only sold for the 06 model year. The Cayenne skipped 07 and came back in 08 with the facelift, and the Turbo S also came back, but it looked different. So the original Cayenne Turbo S was only offered in 06, and it was very expensive, so not many people bought it. This is a pretty rare vehicle. All right, driving the original Cayenne Turbo S, 520 horsepower, and this one has been tuned, and it has a little bit extra. The seller was telling me maybe around 600 horsepower in this thing. It is a serious beast. It was back then, it still is today. So let's talk about that performance. You step on it, you do have a little turbo lag, and then you are rocketed rocketed for. One thing that always surprised me about this Cayenne, you know, the next generation Cayenne Turbo was also very, very fast, but it always seemed like it should be. This car was heavy. It was kind of big. It was kind of bulky. It was a pretty heavy car, and yet it was big, big speed. Like, they managed to neutralize the weight by making it just fast, just by throwing an enormous amount of power at it. And they figured that'll do it, and it did. It really, really worked. These cars still feel fast today. 0-60 to 60 in the mid to high fours. At the time, it really 
really was a revolution. You had just coming on the market the ML63 AMG and the new Jeep SRT8. This was a competitor for the ML63, uh, but it came out a little bit earlier. And the regular Cayenne Turbo came out several years earlier. The Jeep Grand Cherokee SRT8 was an amazing car with amazing performance, but the interior was truly awful. It was like laughably bad. And so that was never really a, a luxury performance SUV. This was kind of the beginning of the performance luxury SUV world, which has grown to the point where now every, basically every luxury brand has one, including Acura, the MDX Type S. That's where we are. Now, these old Cayenne models, you know, you hear different things. I, I've heard from some people that they're pretty reliable. I've heard from others that they aren't. This one has 59,000 miles. I, <laughs> you hear some, some horror stories about these, but I also have noticed we've sold a bunch on cars and bids that have over 200,000 miles. And my view has always been if, if cars are getting to that level, they can't be that bad, right? But I do, I do think it must take a, a little bit of dedication to keep this car running. However, at 59,000 miles, you probably have a ways to go before anything really serious starts to happen. Still, it is a, you know, German performance vehicle from 20 years ago. So it's not going to be probably the, it's not going to be a Toyota Land Cruiser, but off-road it might be. That's one of the cool things about these early Cayennes compared to later ones. These had two-speed transfer case, air suspension, they could do stuff. And you've noticed that people have started to lift them and do other stuff, put big off-road tires on them because they actually were capable vehicles. And so you can really have some fun. Combine that with the power and you can like have like real Ford Raptor style Baja off-road fun if you want to. One other cool thing about these early Cayennes is they still feel pretty nice. Like they're still luxurious vehicles in a way that, that surprises me every time I get in one. The interior, I don't want to say the interior is timeless, especially because it has this ridiculous button situation for the infotainment, but like sitting in here and looking around, it still looks nice. Like it still looks luxurious. You had just come out of the late 90s, early 2000s when there was just plastic in every car, just way too much plastic. And automakers were like, we got to get away from that stuff. And even Porsche did that with the 996 and the Boxster. So this car really did start to get away from it. It really did have like a nicer interior. They knew they had to do better and they did. And this car still feels like it has a nice, luxurious interior. Now, one interesting thing about these early Cayenne models, Porsche said the, the, the BMW X5 came out in 2000 and, and the Cayenne came out in 03. And Porsche said, when you drive our Cayenne, the X5 is going to feel like a truck. I never felt that way. I, I always felt like these drove um, similar to the X5, but the problem that Porsche always had was because they went with the off-roading stuff, they had to make, they just had a big curb weight. They had to neutralize this, this substantially heavy vehicle. And I think they did a good job considering the weight. And this car is lighter on its feet than it has any right to be given its length and its size and its weight. But I never really did feel that it was, it was quite the performance car that, that, that it could have been. The steering and handling is good. It's impressive for the size and for the weight and for the year, but it wasn't until the Panamera came out in 2010 that to me, Porsche really was like, wow, you can do this with a car this size. And I felt that way about the, the later Cayenne as well. Maybe that's just uh, sort of hindsight bias looking at it from a modern lens. At the time, I'm sure this car was unbelievable in terms of its handling. Overall though, these cars are amazing. They're incredibly fast. Um, they still feel, look, and drive nice. They handle reasonably well. There's just a lot of great stuff about these cars, and they're not all that expensive. And I always enjoy my time in an early Cayenne, especially one with this much power. And so that's the 2006 Porsche Cayenne Turbo S. These days, we take performance luxury SUVs for granted because there's so many of them from AMG, from BMW M, from Porsche, even from Lamborghini and Bentley and Maserati and Ferrari. But back in 2006, this was the big dog. And now you know everything about it. And now it's time to give this Turbo S a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 58 out of 100, which places the Cayenne Turbo S here against some relevant rivals. No surprise, this is at the top. By modern standards, it's not especially high-tech or nimble, but when you compare the Cayenne Turbo S against cars like this from its era, it's an absolute knockout. The fastest SUV on the road, the most exciting among the most luxurious and best equipped. These Cayenne Turbo S models were really a huge deal back in the day, and even all these years later, they're still pretty fun and surprisingly cheap thanks to the magic of depreciation.